No one likes conflict. Okay, maybe I do. <laughs> and since I do like conflict, open your Bibles and turn in the book of James with me. <laughs> Where's Romaine when I need him? Oh, please. <laughs> but normally, normally, most people that I know, maybe you're different like me, you know, maybe you're a little weird, you know, and you enjoy conflict or confrontation of some type, you know, being made conformable by God using confrontation to change us or to rearrange us in some way. But in reality, life, you will get through without there being some type of confrontation. You are going to deal with conflict in your life. There will come that time where you will butt heads with something or somebody or somebody's will that is not your own and you will come into conflict. How you deal with that conflict will determine the reality of your relationship with God or the fact that you have your own personal agenda that you're seeking to advance in some way over another. And so a lot of what determines the results of conflict is based upon what is the foundation of your rationale for dealing and standing by that conflict that you're having. Because the reality is if you gave in, of course there would be no conflict. But what you do with conflict determines the reality of what you're going to accomplish through the conflict. And that's why the book of James was written for us, not to be something to beat each other up with by saying, oh, you know, brother, you don't want to read the book of James. Oh, boy, tough one. But to say, let's enjoy and employ the word of God according to those things that we're going to enhance our relationship with God by going through this conflict as it changes us and changes those we are in conflict with. One of the ways that we do that in Bidivo is that we've actually started a series called Principles of Life. So principles of Life deal with the reality of the practical problems we face as human beings, person to person. You know, those things that person against circumstance, person against government, person against emotion, person against himself, person against antagonist, you know, those protagonists, antagonists, those kind of storylines that, you know, writers know all about because, you know, you have to sit down and if you're one of those designer writers <laughs> that you come up with the conflicts and you have to write them down and make them into story you know, outlines and you do all these kind of like weird kind of ways of putting it all together, well then you find the reality of what conflict does. It enhances a story. It makes it interesting. There has to be something that keeps your attention. God uses the same thing in order to teach you. A lot of times he uses certain principles from the scriptures in order to teach you about life. And life in this life was meant to be abundant, not just in the sense of you're going to get a bunch of money, you know, which some people think that's abundance. But the abundance is the re wealth of the reality of being able to be full in all sensory perceptions, all emotional reactions, and all soulful and spiritual experiences that God wants you to have to completeness. In other words, he wants you to be not just full, but overflowing with all that he is and all that you could learn from this life so that you would have not a purpose-driven life, but a fulfilled satisfaction with knowing God in a personal and intimate way and realizing him in all the principles that life can offer you to train you and to teach you in the way that you should go so that your life does have purpose, meaning, and satisfaction. When you end your life, you can say with God saying to you, I have kept the course, I have run the race, there is laid up for me a crown that is eternal life and I am satisfied that I have done all that I could in this life as well as enjoying the life that's to come in eternity. We use the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts book because it's very good. <laughs> it seems to detail out some wonderful information. Things that have been organized and correlated and usually done in seminars around the country by Bill Gothard ministries and what they were doing at the time. But we expand it and expound upon it according to what the Spirit of God leads us and directs us as we share and you take to prayer those things that work for you. Because one of the things that we're told always in everything, whether it be in Bible study or in life, the 
Bible is always called instructions for life. It has principles that we can apply to our life that are real. They work. Ask any Jew. <laughs> Such a deal. <laughs> and it works. You know, ask any person that's religious without knowing God, and you'll find that they have principles that are from the Bible, that are scriptural. The nation itself is often determined as being a Christian nation because of the morality that it stands by, but also because of the biblical standard that it lifts up as being a standard for conduct, whether through judiciary or legislature or moral or civil code that is codified from the Bible. So there's principles that are pulled from Scripture that are used in life, and that's why this is principles of life, because we can rearrange and bring our life in accordance with God's will if we would choose to do those things that God has said to us to do and to learn principles of life so that our life would be more meaningful and we would learn how to deal with those conflicts that are going to come up in our life. In the new section that we've been doing, we now have arrived to the place where we've already dealt with a lot in the past and normally I go through kind of a review after three or four you know, these videos, but today we'll just go right into the study. And what we're studying is how to get the greatest benefit from your problems. So open with me to the book of James. <laughs> and you can cut short this entire video just by reading James 1.1. 1, 1. Count all joy, brethren, when you fall the diverse struggle and tribulations. No, you have to work in your faith, produce patience, but let patience have its perfect work that the man got me and be fully equipped, you know, and blah, blah, blah. You know, the bottom line, you know, it's like you don't want to read it, so you don't want to go there, so you're not going to learn it, you know, so let's learn it the hard way. But if you really want to learn the shortest distance between two points, it's always the Bible, but unfortunately, we don't always understand the Bible. So, like, when we do look at James, you know, we kind of go, well, you know, James is one of those kind of books that, you know, I look at, but I don't get it, you know. I don't understand it, you know. I just kind of pay attention to what, you know, people say about James, but I don't really take it personally or adapt it to myself, you know, morally or even have it apply to me, you know, as though I'm the one that he's being written to. But the truth is, James is written to you. It's written so that you would be changed by the very Word of God alive and well and living in you and causing you to deal with the conflict that you have in your life with the spiritual life. Even as it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, yeah, bro, guess what? Hey, check it out, man. Count it all joy when you fall into divers tribulations, temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith produces patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that to give to all men liberally, and a breed of thought that shall be given him. But, oops, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth like the wave of the sea, driven by the wind. But let no man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. In other words, if you really wanted to be smart, you don't have to do principles of life. You don't have to read some other book. You don't have to go anywhere but James. James 1.5 tells you if any man lack wisdom, hey, check it, do it, learn it, grab it, apply it, ask God, he'll tell you. But unfortunately, if you recognize that you don't always hear with your hearing, see with your seeing, and understand with your understanding, but that you're being transformed, then you begin to recognize that there are principles of life that adapt you for a better way of understanding the Bible, not replacing the Bible. And that's why the Institute of Basic Youth Conflict Seminar is always about the Word of God, with the Word of God in it, applied to the principles of life. So, in learning how to get the greatest benefit from your problems, we're going to discuss five areas. Only today, we're probably going to discuss maybe one, <laughs> and maybe two or three or four or five. No, actually one or two, depending upon how it goes. Usually when I try to break them up into sections like one, two, three, four, or five, if it has it, because there's always so much more volume than the summary that's being said. And a lot of times people will read a summary and not apply it to themselves because they take it out of context and just cut to the quick notes and never really deal with it personally. They don't say it's me that's in conflict or this doesn't apply to me when in reality if they thought it through it would do what it's meant to accomplish in you and that's why you're watching this video because there is a reason why you're watching why you're paying attention and why you're hearing it is because God wants to do something in you that you're carrying some kind of baggage that you need to deal with 
whether it be of life or wife or kids or home or house or spouse or wherever it is that you're dealing with whatever kind of conflict you're going through, every day has conflicting issues that come up, even if it is boiled down to the simplest one of all, which is wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principality and power, spiritual wisdom, and sign place. That's pretty simple, right? Wrong. That's pretty detailed. So a lot of times people will quote some fanciful scripture and never apply it to their life because they just, ah, you know, they say something spiritual sounds good, you know, and they just go, yeah, fine, you know, I'll deal with that in the sweet by and by, you know. Or, you know, yeah, but, you know, we got to cover. And you don't. The truth is, you're in conflict and you don't know how to deal with it. And so that's why we go through these in depth, trying to apply that which fits according to the scripture and according to our personal way of God applying the Holy Spirit to our lives because it's the Spirit of God that's teaching you, not me. I don't have any great, you know, theological background. Okay, maybe some. <laughs> I don't have any great wisdom. Okay, maybe some. I don't have any great, you know, whatever. Okay, maybe some. But maybe, you know, there might be something that you could glean from and get some application to yourself so that you could learn from and grow there in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the wisdom that he's got for you because if you were wise enough to already apply James 1 5 you wouldn't need this but we all need encouragement we all need to be taught and learn and apply the scriptures accordingly as we are given wisdom as we are given need as the conflicts arise in our life so five different areas are benefits to us and the first benefit is the benefit of getting more grace from God. That's how to get a benefit from your problem. Your problem actually helps you get more grace from God. Number two is the benefit of self-examination. Number three is the benefit of new insight into scripture. And number four is the benefit of unifying the family. Now I know a lot of people are saying, wait a minute, my problems are to unify my family? My problem is divide my family. Well, yeah, if you got a family. <laughs> so you see, sometimes the reality of conflict, if you're just reading some book, you'll say, ah, it doesn't apply to me, I don't have a family. Well, it does apply to you, and you'll see when we go through it. I'll make sure it applies, because <laughs> I've been there, done that. There isn't much I really haven't tried in the hard way. Matter of fact, I've experienced a lot of things a variety of ways so that I would be equipped today to be able to share in those problems the wisdom with which God had given me or as we say the grace with which I received I am able to give to others the same grace extending to them mercy and grace according to that which, which I was given and that's what the Holy Spirit does in our life with principles of life he takes our life and uses it as an object lesson to make us objectify our experiences in life so that we can use them to minister to others the same grace and mercy we've been given that's what it's all about. That's what's called being a witness. Hello. And so number five is the benefit of uniting the families of a church. A lot of times you'll see that most of the times what happens in churches is really just the same extension that's gone on in the personal family. If you look at the family life, you'll see the church life. If you look at the church life, you'll see the family life. Whenever there's a conflict in a church, you can look at the families and see the same thing going on. Conflict is good. It really is. There are benefits from it. Conflict is bad when you deal with it wrongly. It's a neuter. It's something that can be beneficial to us, but it's not something that should be rejected. The same thing about when people say, well, you know, I don't want stress. I do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Stress is the production of taking your fat, that little fatty muscle that you have, and putting stress on it so that it becomes a muscle instead of just being a little fatty cell, you know, that's sitting there getting, you know, kind of like cancerified or whatever you want to call it or fat or kind of saucy or floppy or whatever you want to say it is cellulite you know and stored full of nothing in it you know just a bunch of yuck well me personally no I want it to be stressed I want it to develop into what is meant to be a muscle a muscle tissue that's not under stress becomes a fat tissue likewise coal under stress becomes a diamond a Christian under stress becomes faithful, not faithless. So stress is good. Don't think that the idea that we have in medicine that stress is bad. It's how you deal with stress. So the point is stress is neutral. The same thing is true about conflict. The same thing is true about problems. And that's what we're dealing with is problems. Whenever I have a problem, 
I'm told that I can either flee, you know, there, there's no flee, fight, or, you know, defend yourself, or there's actually seven different ways that you can deal with the problem. You know, you can resolve it, you can, I mean, there's, I didn't sit down to think about problems because I was thinking, well, that should be another teaching, and I suddenly my mind went off to another tangent, you know, I said, wow, I could start another one. Um, there are different, there's at least seven, there's probably 49, I always think seven times 70 is 49, you know, we get to these different variations that in Jewish thought, you could go off of seven, you could make, believe me, a bunch of applications. But in seven different areas, I know there's got to be, you know, ways that you can deal with something neutral like a problem. It's just because I've dealt with seven different ways of other things that you could deal with it, so I kind of always play that in because it's a complete number and there's ways to applicably apply it to your life in all the different areas of your life that there are. And people write these little circles and they put this problem and they put that, you know, concentric circles overlapping of what they do and you can see it in a picture. We don't have a chalkboard. <laughs> I was going to teach this with chalkboards. I started to and unfortunately, here we are doing what we do as we do the way we do it. So. In saying that, most of us want quick solutions to our problems, but God wants to make sure that all his disciplines of character development in us and those around us are accomplished before he removes the problem. Circular reasoning is the idea of going around in a circle. You start from point A, you go all the way around the circle and come back to point A. What you are going to experience in life is something like that. You are going to go through kind of a circular, almost like a ball effect, where instead of you going around in a circle like on a line facing downward, you're going on a line facing upward. And if you happen to get through that circle and you have learned all that you are meant to learn, you start on another circle going upward. It's like a ladder of circles. If you could think of circular ascension or circumferential ascension on a deck on a uh, inclination scale meaning that you're continu <laughs> I'm going to get into some early words that people are going to go what <laughs> but anyways circular ascension on an inclination is simply the circle on top of a circle on top of a circle on top of a circle overlapping so that you're always going on and then where they interject or where they cross over each other is where you're coming into conflict you learn from it and move on or you don't and you go back around the same circle. God does that in life. You've seen it. You've seen it with the children of Israel making the same mistake over and over and over again. It's like, how many times are you going to do that again? But they got wiser each time. Each time that it was going through that learning process, they got smarter. That's how God deals with you. He does that in a discipline that creates in us the appreciation of the fact that not only does his grace extend to us but his mercy endures forever because we are constantly going through that process until we are learned and have learned the lesson that God wants to accomplish in us and so developing our character is what the problem is about it's not about solution of the problem itself it's about the development of the character through a principle of life that we can make applicable to ourselves so that it comes out from within us rather than affects from without to inside us. Things that provoke us from the outside cause reactions from us from the inside out. And that's why our mouth and our thought process and our heart is so guarded and we need to be careful of what we do. We should not be reacting, but we should be acting upon that with which we have thought about, which we have prayed about, which we have talked about, which we have reasoned and rationalized with God, and then sat down and determined a plan of action or a course of direction that he says we should do according to his word. So, when he says his disciplines of character development in us and those around us are accomplished before he removes the problems, it's not just me, which it should be started there, but it's you. And so, when you have conflict, it takes two. In other words, there has to be the active part of some reactionary causatory effect that's going on to cause you to butt heads with something. This has to be one thing that you have to learn everything from, and this has to be something that you learn everything from. What more can you get out of this conflict? What more can you get out of beating your head against the wall except that it's a wall? Well, of course there's more to the wall. What kind of texture does it have? What kind of height? What depth? Can you crawl under it? No. Okay. Well, can you go around it? No. Okay. Can you go over it? No. Okay. Can you go through it? No. Well, then what's God going to do? He's going to take you past it somehow. <laughs>
Dimensional reality shift. Woo-hoo. Where do we all go? Oh, well, we're past it. Hey, there's always alternatives. And that's one of the things that our mindset often needs to be changed from where we were to where God is. Because with God, all things are possible. With man, it's impossible. And that's what Jesus kept trying to say to us whenever he was talking to any of the disciples or to even people that came up to him and asked him a question. They would say, well, you know, how can you be born again? You know, that which is flesh is flesh, that born is spirit is spirit, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, with man, it's impossible. You know, they can't do it. He can't do it himself. Man can't. Man can't resolve his own conflict. Physician, heal thyself, and the physician goes, yeah, right, sure. You know, up to a point he can take care of an initial problem, but he can't heal himself. And the reality is you don't see a faith healer healing himself by faith. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Often, it's one of the sure indicators that they're changing their mind because they find themselves sick. <laughs> the same thing is true with the application of the principle of life. With God, all things are possible. With man, not so much. So, we learn that our benefits are not from quick solutions, but until we are resolved the absolution of the problem itself so that it's no longer a problem, but a benefit. And that's really where you begin to move on in life when you recognize, as James said, that you can count it all joy because it's not a problem, but it's a opportunity. And once you shift your focus, you begin to pull from it lessons you can learn in your evaluation of what you're going through rather than what you're supposedly dealing with. A lot of people pray in their mindset when they want a quick solution. They just say, oh God, take it away. I'm like, no, increase it. <laughs> Man, burn it out of me. You know, Beat me up. Tear me down. Nail my hide to the cross. Get rid of this fleshy thing. Whatever it may be. And that's the reality of what we should be praying as Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not wanting my will, God, but, you know, if it's possible, you know, some other way, great, let's take it, you know. But he said, no, of course not my will, but thy will be done. And that's what we should be praying, always. So, the other point about there being a benefit to our problems and what we can learn that benefit is, he's also not just concerned about our character development in us and those we have conflict with and the discipline that we can learn from it, but he's also concerned about the right procedure to be followed in solving the problems that the problems are actually resolved and not just covered over or hidden. It is the process of solving our problems that constitutes the most meaningful chapters of our life message and becomes the greatest help to other people. You see, anyone can make a problem go away. Really. I mean, you know, you get a bill in the, you get a overdue notice in the mail, you know, you're, you get an overdue notice, yeah, there you go, you get an overdue notice in the mail, you can make it go away. You throw it in the trash can, ignore it, right? You know, until the consequences of your action produce a reaction and your lights are turned off. A, <laughs> that was kind of not the best way to resolve the problem. And B, it wasn't a good precedent to set for your children, you know, because your children might turn out to be the same way you are, and guess what? When they want to pay you back, they're not going to pay you back. Whoa! Don't loan them money. So you see, principles of life are about how we deal with things also, not just solving the issue. So when we are in the process of being concerned about the right procedure, we're talking about the right way to do something. You know, how do you do it? You know, do you think that obviously taking every tax benefit there is is the way to go? Because, you know, you might be a little fudgy on some of your numbers. Well, if you get audited, did you learn from it or learn to better appreciate you don't have to do all that you think you want to do? Because the way you do it may determine whether or not you did it right or wrong. And that's why the bottom line of what we say in cliches are the end doesn't justify the means. In other words, just because you get there doesn't mean you did it the right way. And Jesus is more importantly determining for ourselves, revealing every day that we're alive, why are you doing it? What are you doing it? How are you doing it? You know, in school you learn the old who, what, when, where, how, and why. And 
That's what God is concerned about in our life with every conflict we run into, with every problem that we seem to be facing. There is a who are we having a problem with? What is the real problem or what's the problem? You can do a bunch of different varieties of that when you say what because you can do that with who too. I always say seven for each one. You know, It's like, well, you know, get creative you know, and you really can't. But the who, the what, the where, you know, where is there a conflict? Is it in your soul? Is it in your emotions? Is it in your life? Is it in your family? Is it in your, you know, and the, the issues of conflicts we learned earlier affects everything in our life. You know, when you have a conflict, whether you know it or not, you're carrying that baggage around with you all day long affecting everything that you're doing. It's in the back of your mind, you say, oh, well, I, I have a categorical mind. I'm able to file it or compartmentalize it. No, you're not. That's just some psychological psychobabble that some sociologists came up with in order to say that some people deal with it better than other people, so they compartmentalize it. No, they don't. It's still there. You just don't see it. And that's why Jesus said the things that are hidden would be shouted from the rooftops. The things that are done in darkness would be made manifest by the light. And the reality of being truthful is truthful because God is the one we're dealing with. God is the one who's bringing the issue to light. God is the one who is showing us that our problem is an opportunity to learn. If we're truthful and we're willing to do it his way, not our way, as we said about in the Garden of Gethsemane. We want to get out from under pressure of our problems, but God wants to use that pressure to motivate us to a greater level of spiritual maturity than we would otherwise have achieved. Crucifying with Christ, literally, and that's what God wants. God wants to put the screws on you so that you will come to the place where you realize with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. You fall on your face and find to the place that you can't do it yourself, but he can do it for you. See, the backwards thinking in Christian mentality, I just dealt with a few minutes ago on the web, but one of the worst expressions is God needs you, or you are God's hands and feet, or you're partnering with God to do something, or you're somehow a part of God's plan. Well, you are, but not the way you think. Because God uses you every moment of your life, irregardless of whether you're doing it for being a vessel of honor or a vessel of wrath, because he's using you as an object lesson. And quite frankly, I'd rather be considered an object lesson for doing something right than an object lesson for doing something wrong. I'd rather be an object lesson of being smart than be an object lesson of something stupid, you know, which is usually what I am. But the point is, no. You are not God's hands. You are not his feet. God doesn't need you. God doesn't require anything from you. God can do it himself. God does do it himself. You get to participate with him or see what he's able to do with you, irregardless of whether you understand that or not. A lot of Christian theology, a lot of Christian discipleship likes to make out those little cliches because it sounds good at first when you're starting off as a baby Christian. But the bottom line is that if we were treating each other as adults and we were respecting each other as not having to lie to one another, then we never would have said that in the first place. And that's why I disagree with a lot of Christian discipleship and material that's out there because it's false pretenses that is being made aware to Christians that are baby Christians without saying the rest of the story of what God said. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. And that's basically what God wants to do. Crucify you. No, he doesn't say, you know, you get grace and it's all done and over with. He does, and it is true. But you will still have to crucify your flesh. You will still have to live according to his will. You will still have to do things that God says to do. Because if you don't, you're in rebellion to God. And it says that if you are in rebellion to God, you never were saved in the first place. You thought you were, maybe. I don't think so, but I think you knew all along. But the point is... For our perspective, looking on the outside, we say, man, that guy was so obedient. And on the inside, God had said, no, I told you to do this. You never did it. You never accepted me. I've been trying to talk to you ever since. You never got back to me once. You just ran forward in a great revival meeting, you know, and said, I did it, you know, and I got it, and I'm gone, you know. I did it, I got it, I'm gone. That's a famous line of those that think they're saved and have no personal relationship, no interaction with God himself, though grace has been extended to them in mercy for a season until that time they have a reason either to make the choice 
or be rejected as having made a choice to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, or else they are not serving God, they are serving themselves. And so, in a lot of ways, grace is covered by the reality of what we see, but we allow the time for God to work according to what we can't see. So, God wants to use that pressure on us to motivate us to a greater level of spiritual maturity that we would otherwise have achieved, because a lot of times, most Christians will look back on their life and they'll say, you know, I was going to church and I was doing the right thing and I thought I was saved and by golly, you know what? It was nothing compared to what I got now. I know the day I got saved. And they do. They know the moment they went from religious life, which, you know, nothing wrong with religion, but you have to add a relationship. Religion puts you into a relationship and then you live your relationship religiously. They're combined. They're an integral part of each other. They're overlapping circles. Concentric circles of escalation, of concentric, concentric, concentric circular of applicational relations, relational escalation or something like that. And when I did the study I call integral specificity, a type of theology that you know I've written, I used a lot of you know for theologians, you know, a lot of all this kind of mathematical equational relational basis for what is going on in scripture and what is going on in life because mathematics does apply to life and it's something that you know a lot of people use in you know theoretical sciences but anyways I just did it in theology and thought it was great <laughs> and it works oh well the Bible fits who, who thought <laughs> who would have thought God did but as he uses those pressures we find it is James 1 you know 3 or whatever it is James that causes us to recognize that it isn't the problem but it's the pressure that wants to make us move in the right direction so that we would accomplish it according to the way he wants when he wants how he wants as he wants choosing to use that as a way to teach you and for you to learn from him according to life itself and the principles of life because God is the author of life he's the beginning and the end of all life and he is as Jesus said eternal life itself Often our present problems are the result of past disobedience to the initial promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now God is using these problems to apply the pressures we need to complete obedience. If we fail to gain these benefits from our present problems, he will only have to raise up new problems. The whole idea, and it's funny, we didn't even get to number one, but you know, this was a good introduction to all five of the benefits from our problems. And this introduction, the reality is true that the problem is not with us. The problem is not with God. The problem is not with someone or of something. The problem is our definition of the reality of it being a learning experience where we are supposed to grow from the issue and the resolution. When I was going to, when I was going to, when I was work, well actually when I was going to college or a uh, tech school um, computer learning center to study network engineering I worked at a, a uh, job <laughs> a what? <laughs> a job a job wow what is that? <laughs> it's so far away removed from me now no I worked at a job at um, Toshiba America Electronics Components Toshiba is short but it was the administrative offices of Toshiba America and um, Inside of it, it was a massive managerial supervisory kind of conglomerate of people that were really high IQ. You know, and how I got a job was I was a temp agent. <laughs> I was working for a temp agency. So I got on as a, they called them contingency workers. And in those days, everything had, you know, what nowadays people are arguing about proper language is just, hey, they were articulate. You know, they knew how to use vocabulary. Nowadays, I think people are trying to use um, slam vocabulary because they don't have one and they're trying to make it sound as though it were proper, you know, it's wrong to use proper language and that you got to rap it instead. Well, I can do both, you know, Jap and rap and depth, you know, whatever. And uh, <laughs> I don't want to get into it. But when I was working at Toshiba, they also practiced besides, you know, articulation because they were, you know, of a intelligent quotient so it was higher and they were dealing with a lot of, you know, high-end stuff that was especially true with uh, computers and with, you know, we were switching over from a, a uh, 
kind of a database system to Oracle, an initial Oracle kind of thing that was one of the early leaders before there was uh, some issues with the way that the stock market works and some of the other things that some companies like Enron got busted for. <laughs> there were a lot of companies that really were not just uh, Enron, but did things like Enron. But in the old days, you know, back then when I worked there, one of the things that they exercised was what was called a Japanese style of management. And the Japanese style of management was that the company, and yeah, they call them company, you know, was the important part, was that we were there to accomplish goals. And those goals were to resolve issues. The issue of you know being profitable, how do we resolve it? And everyone would participate in it. Everyone would participate. It was a conglomerate, work together kind of atmosphere that was very good for me to understand what it was like to work cooperatively together on team projects without there being someone in charge. Although there was an echelon, 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 there was an echelon of you know responsibilities and management that was above and below and all that stuff. The reality of how we dealt with things was on a equal, you know, equal basis, and I was in severely intimidated by it because I was pretty shy in those days. And you know, shy me? Who? Where? Huh? Did I say that? I'm a little shy. But having said that. Working there, I learned a lot about that kind of style of management and the cooperative reasoning and rationale that put itself into proper perspective when it came to the scriptures because that's what God wants to do in you and I. He doesn't want us to treat each other as a problem and a solution or to say, you're in sin and I'm not, so guess what, suffer sucker, <laughs> goodbye. But no, to pray for, to intercede on behalf. If there's something I can do, in activity wise to help provide the environment for you to grow out of your immaturity or your sandbox or whatever it is you're playing in because you're playing with life instead of living it then that's what principles of life did and does and how I learned it in my real life was according to some of the management techniques that were out there I learned that there was cause and effect that you could create with God the place where people could evolve or learn as it were because evolve some people get evolution mixed up with evolve and they think it's a bad thing so having said that we all are heading in the same direction we're going to the same destination we're going to heaven guess what we've been given grace there's no reason to not enjoy and have an abundant life for that purpose of every day being able to deal with each other on a regular basis because frankly the bottom line is like Romania used to say, you're stuck with me, sucker. You gotta deal with me the rest of eternity. Deal with it now. <laughs> you know, and okay, oh, you know. And one of the things that I learned early on, you know, not through the seminars, because I never went to one of the seminars. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> and yet I'm teaching it. Oh well, who would have figured? Where's Bill Gothard? But but having said that, one of the things I learned early on, you change one five, you know, and kinda like direct application was that Romain would say and stand up in front of the church and say hey you know what find somebody you can't stand in the church and then go stay with them live with them or you know be their friend well I did for all my Christian life most of my friends they, whether they know it or not you know if they watch this video I'm in trouble I don't have very many friends but whoever I couldn't stand in church whatever church I went to I'd sit next to them. I'd, I'd meet them, greet them, talk to them, figure out that, yeah, I can't stand them, but guess what? I learned to grow with them, to be a part of their life, to encourage them at the portion of life that I was with them in, and to develop with them some of the graces that they may still have today. Some don't, but, you know, go figure. But, you know, some have grown and become more men of God, you know, and greater for the experience that we shared together. Sometimes, because I was young and dumb at it, you know, and I learned from it, I had to develop my own graces and by being stumbled over them, you know, I likewise experienced how God intended to do it the right way, even though I had the right intention, the right perspective, I may not have been doing it or implementing it the right way. And so that's why principles of life are so real, because they are about life. They're about how you're dealing with 
your everyday experiences as we've had those everyday experiences in some ways of the scriptures recorded for us so that we would learn from the Old Testament and learn from the New that we can apply to life in everything we say and everything we do so that we would not be children tossed to and fro with every whim of doctrine and every kind of you know conflict that comes along so that we're reacting and acting according to the world and letting anything that's out there affect our peace, our love, and our joy. Or we can be those wellsprings of those desert places, those, I start saying Moshavs, but they're not Moshav, those um, oasis in the middle of a hot, dry desert where people will come and taste of you and see, wow, man, I like talking to that guy. He makes sense. Or girl, or woman, or man. And it's because you're sharing with them just the life lessons that you've learned that are principles of life that come directly from the author of life, from Jesus himself. Because Jesus came to give us life, and life more abundantly in this world, as well as life to come in the next. So Father, I thank you that there are principles that we can take from the Word of God, from the life we're living, and from the way that the Spirit of God applies these things to our life. Heavenly Father, I pray that as you have given the Holy Spirit opportunity to live inside us I pray that you'll give him permission to go beyond us so that he'll overcome our flesh and at times our misunderstandings so that we would know the fullness and the depth of your sufferings as well as your glory so that we can see how to live our lives according to your will father and not our own so that if we are experiencing the Gethsemane's we can go through them and pass on to the cross and be resurrected or if we are going through those Jacob's trials of trying to manipulate you or doing the Moses thing where we're acting out according the wrong way and killing someone in order to learn the right way to trust in you so that we would not do it our way but we would do it as you are doing it and allowing you to accomplish your purpose in parting the land or parting the water and causing even the Egyptian army to stand back because of the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. So Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that has the Holy Spirit that you would teach us principles. You would lead us by the Word of God. You would inspire in us to be changed by the renewing of our mind that we might comprehend what is the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus and then be content therein to live according to your will and your principles in your life. Amen. God bless you. You know, it gets exciting. It really does. Once you figure this out, you, know, you kind of go, cool, that's what it is. That makes perfect sense. And then you find out it's not common sense. It's God sense. God makes sense. <laughs>